If you believe God for a miracle and you know we can do the impossible, shout yeah. Yes, I believe God for a miracle. We've been looking at the Holy Spirit from the scripture, who he is, what he does. And um, in John's gospel, Jesus refers to him as the comforter. And I've been examining that all week and thinking about how he comforts us. I don't know about most people in Christendom, but when I read scripture, the Lord always either uses a biblical character or someone in my life to drive home the lesson that he's trying to teach. And so when I thought about the comforter, the Holy Spirit, I thought about my mother and how she comforted not only me, but just about anybody who came to her. I began to think about how there was never any off limits for her, that anyone could get into her heart. Once you got into her heart, you were in her circle. And people in her circle, she was extremely vulnerable to those people. I thought about how her door was never closed how she just opened it up. There are people that would come from the church and family and everybody, you know, it was just, she, she never, she's like the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And I said, Lord, I, I'm, I'm trying to draw some sort of correlation. And Jesus said, that's how the Holy Spirit is. Once you are born of God and he comes into your heart, he doesn't cast you away, no matter what you've done. Isn't it amazing how we can turn our backs on people, and yet God never turns his back on us? Isn't it amazing how we become hard-hearted and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not going to help Steve out because he knew better, but the Holy Spirit never does that to us. I was having devotion with God one day, and he, he, he said something to me, and it really shocked me. He said, my people are extremely hard-hearted. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they'll use phrases such as, get over it, move on with your life. He said, I never tell you to get over it. He said, I comfort you until you grow out of it. And I said, but Father, doesn't that like make us dependent, make us babies? He said, no, because what's happening is you're going through a healing process. And all healing needs isolation, needs comfort and care. So when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit being a comforter, I looked at three areas that this comfort is personified in Scripture. There are three basic areas. Number one, he helps us by building character because we lack character. It's because we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. It's because our hearts are desperately wicked. It's because we grow up in an environment of self-centeredness and narcissism or personal ambitions that drive us to the point of being ignorant of other people's needs. It's because we grow up in a, a, a sinful world and the primary foundation of sin, there are secondary and tertiary foundations in my theology, but the primary foundation of sin is selfishness. It's really you to lord over my life, and then the flip side is but I'm going to run my life. And man has been pulling away from God 
for thousands and thousands of years. Unfortunately, the church has gone through this evolution of selfishness to the point where we demonstrate selfishness. And so the Holy Spirit is here as our comforter, our helper, to build character. This is identified in the book of Galatians where Paul talks about the, the fruit of the Spirit, the results of the Spirit life. I, I dare not stand before you to suggest that the Christian life is easy. I only suggest that it's doable. I do not suggest that it's a life without struggle. I only say that it's a life with the help of the Lord. And so if you have these pie-in-the-sky mentalities, you will need to abandon them and then create a realistic view of Christianity that says, I'm going to struggle. Down through the years of, uh, uh, of great philosophical teaching, one of the primary arguments amongst these great thinkers is the problem of evil in the world that brings about the struggle. And so what the Pentecostal Christian has done, whereas most mainline religions teach their disciples how to use struggle and rise above it on the buoyancy or the wind of the struggle. Pentecostal believers has, have made their reputation by suggesting that God is responsible to remove all struggle, and that's why our response to struggle is negative. Amen. We become overwhelmed by problems to the point where we cannot function. Why is that? Because we did not think that there would be a substantial struggle. We thought we could simply say, in the name of Jesus, we thought we could bind the devil, we thought we could plead the blood, and the situation would be dismissed. And so it created spiritual laziness that makes us think that, oh, we can just dismiss it through a few words of witchcraft. Instead of realizing that Jesus promised us in John's gospel, chapter 16, that in the world you will have trouble. That's a promise. Everybody's looking for the promises of God. That's a promise. He said, but be of good courage. The King James says, be of good cheer. In other words, take heart. Why? I have overcome the world. What he does is causes us to shift our vision from the problem to the relationship. My response to struggle, to people, to situations is not avoidance, but I just don't let people get the better of me. The greatest revelation of my short life has been that all souls belong to God. And the very God that gives me peace will also send turmoil. Now, if I can rest in him during seasons of peace, then I can rest in him during seasons of turmoil. And why is it that we tend to lose our joy when a negative thing happens? Why? Because our concept is that God is there to, to, to absent us from struggle. I met with a young man who began to go down a whole list of the things that were going wrong in his life. And I sat there and listened to him, and I had no words of wisdom. So the Holy Spirit simply said, just tell him he's going through a Job situation. And I sat and said, you're just going through your Job situation. And he said to me, isn't that amazing? I was listening to that on my CD player. You see how God is? And so he gives us the Holy Spirit to do what? Not remove the trial, but strengthen you to handle it. I used this analogy last week. I said, when you first start school, I remember the innocence of my kindergarten years. I remember the fun of milk and cookie time. 
the graham cracker that was ceremonially broken and this is my body which is broken for you. And the teacher would give out one quarter of the graham cracker to the, to the uh, students in the class. And there was always somebody inevitably that would eat their cracker quickly and then want part of yours. And then you had the half a pint of seal test milk and all oh, the joy of putting the cookie in your mouth dry and saturating it with the milk and sitting there and enjoying your snack time. And then there was the ever-present nap time. Wasn't that great? All right, everybody, nap time. And we had cots that we could lay on. So I'm told this. I, I don't know this personally, but this is what they did for some people. I like history, so I talked to some of you. And they had cots that they would lay on, and you would lay down, and the teacher would oversee your nap time and the innocence. And when you would awaken from your nap time, they would go back into simple lessons of learning. And then comes the graduation into first grade, and first grade was C-Spot Run, Dick and Jane. The beauty of those days where they were always two sexes. It wasn't Jane and Marie, it was Dick and Jane. It wasn't Dick and Tom, it was Dick and Jane. There was no confusion about sexuality. We did have some girls who could navigate the monkey bars with skill, but they, were st they did it in a dress. So I'm told. Math was one apple plus one apple equals two apples. Simple. But then each year, math grew harder until numbers were replaced with letters. And then you started seeing exponent signs. And then you started seeing parentheses. And then you started seeing groupings. And then you started seeing uh, formulas that didn't make sense. But they couldn't give it to you at first grade. Because all you knew at first grade was C-spot run. That's what God does. You ever notice how there's always somebody in the class who masters what you don't know? And if you were like me, you made them your friend? I mean, come on. Why would you not make the nerd your friend? The first thing you do uh, when, you, when you reached high school, the first thing you did was look for the person that had on a tie and a pocket protector. And you knew that's the one I'm going to befriend because he's going to help me ace this course. He becomes my comforter. The girls don't want him, so you introduce him to certain girls. The teams don't want him, so you always pick him so that when, when the math is difficult, you can say, hey, hey, um, uh, help me out with this, Scotty. And he's like, no problem. I say, I'll get you that milkshake after school. No problem. They would help you. And that's what God says. God says when you go through life and you have all these tests and you have all these trials, the paraclete is the one with the pocket protector. He knows all the answers. He has all of the solutions for your problems, and yet we ignore him because we want to do it ourselves. Pride has replaced humility, and self-righteousness has removed dependency upon God. And Jesus says he's going to be the one who teaches you about me. He's going to be the one to make you like Jesus. How is this accomplished? In Galatians 5, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, the character of foundation, love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, and faithfulness. The Apostle Paul is good for giving us instruction in the basics. And that's a simplistic verse there in Galatians 5, for all of us can stand up and pontificate our spiritual character. I praise God I walk in love. I praise God that I'm peaceful. 
that I have joy and I demonstrate that during moments of despair. I thank God that I find myself wrapped up in goodness and gentleness to all. But then Paul turns around and takes the theoretical and makes it life applicable. When one travels to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, he commands us and says that you walk worthy, in verse 17, of the calling, or not as other Gentiles walk. In the first verse, he says we walk worthy of the calling of God. And in verse 17, he said we're not to walk like other unbelievers. What's he doing? He's saying, look, you must apply those truths you've learned in Galatians 5. If you understand, as Paul continues to preach and teach in practical uh, settings, he says something here that's very, very important. In verse 22, he says, put off the old conversation. The only way you can do that is with the help of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it by yourself. You need a, a, a helper. You need a paraclete. In other words, my old way of dealing with things has been replaced by a new way. I said to Sister Lambert yesterday, I said, I'm growing in the Lord. She says, uh, uh, you know, what do you mean? And, and I said, because my responses are different. I did not say my preaching was different, my praying was different. I said, my responses to idiocy are different. She shared some information with me about things that had been said, about things that I supposedly had done. And in the old days, one of my greatest, greatest crosses, it's still there, but it's not as big as it used to be. My greatest cross was to be blamed for something that I did not do. I could not handle that. I can't handle being accused of what I don't do. And it's, it goes back because... Because of my psychology training, I finally realized where it came from, the, the root of that. And I'm, I'm 28 years old now. And the root of that came from fourth grade. Now listen to this very carefully. In fourth grade, I was bused to John H. Taggart at Fourth and Porter. And we had bus matrons. My, I want you to listen very carefully. I need you to hear what I'm about to say, and then you'll understand why I need the Holy Ghost. My bus, there were two buses that took us from Pratt Arnold to John H. Tag. Now listen very carefully. My bus matron's name was Mrs. Grady. I was on bus two. In bus one was Mrs. Durr. Listen to me very carefully. This is fourth grade. One day in fourth grade, I'm sitting in my class, and next to me, listen carefully, Mrs. Grady, Mrs. Durr, fourth grade. And one day, I pull a pencil out of the desk, and Mary Ann Etheridge is sitting next to me. And Mr. Seitz is my teacher. Listen carefully. When I pulled the pencil out of the desk, the desk had openings, but they didn't raise. The tops didn't raise. And as I pulled it out, I scratched Mary Ann's arm. I apologized. But because she was Japhethite, her arm was red. If she had been a Hamite, you would have never seen it. But because she was Japhethite, her arm was red. And Mr. Seitz said to Marianne, how did you get the scratch on your arm? Marianne Etheridge said to Mr. Robert Seitz in room 603, Eric scratched me with a pencil and ignored the part about an accident. Mr. Robert Seitz stands me up and sends me down to the bus matrons. Not to Mrs. Grady, who was in charge of bus two, but to Mrs. Durr, who's in charge of bus one. She has no authority over me. 
She stands me up in the cafeteria, table number four, next to the window. Takes out a piece of a leather strap, 16 inches long, by two inches wide, by a quarter inch thick, that they nicknamed the general. (laughs) Instructed me to stick out the hand that scratched Marianne Etheridge and proceeded to administer corporal punishment to my right hand. I did not cry. I hated. Now, if you noticed, this was fourth grade. I am so far away from fourth grade, but I can recall with specificity every name, classroom numbers, the amount of time it took to get from the sixth floor down to the cafeteria. Why? Because it affected something on the inside. From that action, the Lord said it was that action that has caused you to still react as a man when you are falsely accused. If you believe God for a miracle and you know we can do the impossible, shout yeah. yeah. If you trust that he'll do 